on the first day of its life. For only then does the lily have that awful need to kill. Does it have that inviting pool of crystal clear liquid in the center? What looks like nectar is not nectar at all. It is a deadly poison, and what is more, the overhanging stamens, at this moment, as smooth as silk. Night falls, and the reason for what seemed a pointless death is now revealed. Inside the floral tomb, the lethal liquid washes the pollen grains from the victim's body. Souvenirs of older, kinder lilies, they sink to fertilize the eggs below. So remember, if you're going to drop in on a lily, be sure to get your timing right. It can be more than your life is worth to visit a virgin flower, as our little hoverfly did. The competition for survival molds all living things for ever greater success in reproduction, and plants are no exception. Many flowers have evolved characteristics to suit only certain pollinators. Night flowers, scented for moths. Or bats. Some methods are very sophisticated. Buzz pollination, the release of pollen by ultrasonic vibrations. Digitalis, foxgloves or finger huts, popular poison for the faint of heart, lures bees to the bottom thimbles first to make sure all are visited in turn. The figwort has a special flower for wasps, hyenas of the insect world, only not quite special enough to prevent a marauding ant from stealing nectar without transferring pollen. The trigger plant is a brilliant design. A hit. And a miss. Oh, well, you can't win them all.
Many desert plants rely on ants. The whole design of this North American plant is typical. It grows near the ground. The leaves and stem intertwine to form aerial walkways, so ants can go from nectar to nectar with minimum effort. The flowers themselves are minute. They don't need to be big. They're not signaling to insects over long distances. As the ant takes the nectar, the stamen anoints its head with a few pollen grains. For the next plant. But of course, not all go-betweens are insects. Anything that wittingly or unwittingly can reliably ferry pollen from flower to flower will do. The pygmy possum eats moths, insects, in fact, almost anything. It eats pollen too, and in doing so, transfers it and becomes one of a very select band of pollinating mammals. It is flight which makes most creatures good pollinators. And some plants have evolved to make use of birds, providing huge quantities of nectar, even changing their flowers in size, shape, and color. Look at the kangaroo's paw. It provides a furry stem for a honey eater to perch on. As it draws from the nectaries, the plant's mechanism works, powdering the bird's head with pollen. This, no lack of invention. With Strelitzia, the sex organs themselves form the perch, cleverly designed to be totally insecure. It's like trying to balance on the slippery pole, and inevitably, the bird puts its foot in it. Here and elsewhere, no doubt. Until recently, there was argument about fertilization of the magnificent African proteas. For some species, birds are obvious candidates they live on the plants, guarding their nest and food supply at the same time. And the proteas, just to make sure, expose their flowers to the heavens so that sunbirds from all over can take their choice. Then why do some species have hidden flowers near the ground growing downwards? Mm -hmm. 